It's called Be The Change, inspired by the words of Mahatma Gandhi, who lived for peace and not violence, and told us to be the change we wish to see in the world. Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom and Ramon. Oh my, my, things are moving in this world. I'll tell you what, Ramon. Now, yeah. Wow. The, the last few weeks has been absolutely amazing. Uh, not only the guests that we've had on, uh, but the content of what we've been talking about and the things that are happening. Uh, I mean, people are... The stuff's coming online. I mean, it, 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 or, I don't know how to express it. Stuff's coming online. I, I mean, it, at least for me, for me, especially I, from my perspective, it's like, oh my God, this is freaking awesome. You know what I mean? Uh, all my intuitive stuff is, is has kicked into like overdrive. Uh, the uh, my energy sensing, the way I'm feeling and sensing energy is just. Oh, geez, I got to tell you, I, w- I went to Seattle yesterday, and uh, I have an uncle who had open-heart surgery, and he's at the University of Washington Hospital up there, and I went up to visit him, and we took off from there and decided we were going to stop by Pike Place Market, it's a big uh, open farmer's market there in downtown Seattle, and we were just driving through town, and it was just packed, I mean... Uh, just way too many people and you know normally when I go out and I go out to the city you know I kind of put up what I, I kind of block all my energetic sensors or shut them down so to say uh, so I, I don't get just a barrage of all sorts of crap well I was right there at uh, first and pike and we were sta- at the stop sign stoplight and I looked around at all the people and I decided I was going to open up and see what the hell happened. See what the hell happened. And I, I just opened up and I guess I opened up too much. And I was just like, uh, I, uh, it, it's hard to describe. I've got, I got such a icky, creepy, gooey, nasty feeling. And then I had a, a sharp pain right in the middle of my back that lasted for like six hours. Uh, it was like, uh, it felt like I, I pinched a nerve or something right in the middle of my back. And it all, all this coincides with me consciously opening my energy, o- opening my sensing sensors to the energy. And I, I immediately shut things down, but it was like I'd already got hit with a two by four. <laughs> uh, so- so you it, like it was an interesting. I, I, I'll tell you what. I learned a tremendous amount about about how I'm how I work my own personal energy and my own fields and how I uh, open up. You know, being kind of you know, semi rural the way I am out here. Uh, you know where I live. Uh, you know, I can open up out here and and not really uh, feel anything nowhere near that magnitude but it was it was quite interesting so yeah i understand what you mean because um when i went to new york uh, two years ago i, I kind of felt that as well like a barrage and i had gotten unused to that energy and i was like whoa what the hell is this yeah um yeah but here's uh something i want to share with you guys on um on my facebook well on the web the main web page, which if you're listening to YouTube, is www.100thmonkeyradio.com. And um, I posted one there, which is the Woody Harrelson one, um, which I found an amazing po- poem that he um, did. 
just absolutely amazing poem. And then the other one is one that was, the video was uploaded to Facebook, so I couldn't put it on the page, on the webpage, or at least I can't find how, but if you go to the 100th Monkey um, Facebook page and you scroll down, it's called um, The New World Wide Trend. And I um, have good news to say about this too as well. So it's basically you see people from around the world just going up to the random homeless people in all countries. I mean, from India, Philippines, Spain, uh, I think there was like Poland, New York City, uh, just different countries and people just going up, bottle of water, some food or a jacket, a hat. One guy comes over, gives him a new pair of sneakers and a, you know, a Yankee cap. And then, um, a friend of mine's here in Japan. He saw the video. He posted up, and he went and did the same. Uh, he owns a shop in Chiba, and then um, he went and did the same. And he oh, gave the awesome. homeless. Yeah, it's just awesome. So it's just you know I haven't had a chance to do that myself, and I was thinking, well, I'm gonna do that. And then he um, beat me to it. Random, you know, just show random me. acts of kindness. Yeah, yeah, which you know. A lot of people would say there's a lot of negative things say with when it comes to you know giving homeless or they become dependent on you and blah 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 blah. And I wouldn't say that every week go and give the same person, you know. But at the same time, when you give to that person, you don't know what you're doing to them. That might be just the right spark they need to say or to figure out how to get themselves. You know what you I know. see out of that, Ramon? I see yeah. the people that witness that. It being a spark More for important. the people that are witnessing, wow, that guy just gave that guy that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Which, the, um, the, I was talking the, about this on a uh, Saturday, how, you know, I used to always complain how, for example, in Japan, it was, it's very common if someone passes out, you'll see people just walk by them. And then, uh, recently I've been witnessing, you know, a few times I, I talked about the different things where, you know, someone would pass out and then people would come and give CPR. And recently in the news, there was one, uh, actually, which is about 30 minutes by train from my house, where this woman got stuck in between the train, uh, between the platform and the train. And usually that's pretty, that's, they usually say that, that you know, that's pretty much you're done. And basically all these people got off the train push these several ton train and pushed it to the point where they can get her out from between the the train and the platform which is just amazing yeah, so it's amazing you know something is happening on the planet whether they you know you realize it or not it's a, there's this or maybe that's what i'm drawing in more into my life is these random acts of kindness that i witness you know i think it's both ramon yeah. I definitely yeah. think it's both. And you're witnessing it, you know, you're seeing it now. Your eyes are open to it. Other people may walk by the same thing and not recognize it at all. That's true. That's true. But it's funny because that was one of my biggest complaints and, and now I can't even complain about that anymore. So that's a good thing. <laughs> oh, you got lost one of your toys. <laughs> Oh, so let's get into our guest tonight. I'm excited yeah, to have her on. I'm really, really excited because when I heard her um, talk, I was just like, yes, we need her on. We need her on. And and the thing she talks about, it's just, we, I, I, I'll get it, to read her bio because I can't wait. <laughs> We've got Cynthia Sue Larson with us tonight. She's a best-selling author and intuitive life coach who helps people transform from accidental manifestors into conscious reality shifters. Cynthia's favorite question in every situation is how could, how good can it get? Cynthia's been featured in numerous TV and radio shows, including the Discovery Channel, History Channel, BBC, uh, and BBC. Uh, Cynthia Sue Larson has a degree in physics from UC Berkeley, an MBA degree, and a Doctor of Divinity. Uh, Cynthia has helped thousands of people discover and develop their visions and goals in optimal alignment with their core strengths and, and the needs of those they serve. Cynthia works with a diverse range of nonprofit, oh, clients, excuse me, misaligned, 
Cynthia works <laughs> with a diverse range oh, of oh clients. My. Oh, hush, Ramon. Uh, Cynthia works with a diverse range of clients from Fortune 500 companies to small startup businesses and nonprofit organizations. Cynthia practices and teaches meditation and martial arts, write book, writes books and articles on top, topics of conscious living, and is a sought after public speaker. Her popular, ma her popular magazine, Reality Shifters, is eagerly awaited each month by thousands of subscribers worldwide. Our website is www.realityshifters.com. And welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio, Cynthia. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tom and Ramon. Oh, it's so, I, I got to start off. Sorry, Tom. Um, you have an amazing smile. I've seen like two different pictures of you and, and just this big, cheesy smile. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, Ramon, you started off. Go ahead. Lay out oh, the first okay. question. Let's get her going. <laughs> well, let's take it simple because I, I'm so ready to jump into the, the meat and potatoes, but you know, let's, um, so wh when did, when did you start, um, questioning things or seeing auras? Um, because I, I know you see auras. Okay, Tom. Okay, can, can, Ramon, can we get a, just a little bit of background first? Yeah, see, I told you I was going to jump into the juice. I should have done. I know. You wanted the meat and potatoes, and I want a little gravy before I throw the potatoes on her. So, <laughs> Cynthia, let me, let me be rude and butt Ramon out of the way for a second. Uh, <laughs> shoot, no, shoot. You, you've got a, 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 a degree in physics, which really, uh, kind of makes me think that you were on the fast track on the science end of things until, uh, something must have happened to kind of shift things into consciousness, or maybe I'm totally off, well, off uh, track here, but, uh, would you explain what actually, uh, happened there to get you into the conscious field out of, uh, a physics background? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, after I, I got my physics degree at UC Berkeley, then I did continue on and got a master's of business administration. So technically I had worked uh, at space sciences laboratory, but then from there I moved on to Citibank and was doing project management activities. And um, it was right around the time I'd, I'd worked at Citibank for about seven years and then had taken a little time off um, to have my two daughters. So I was on kind of a leave of absence. And right about then when I was, um, my, I just had two tiny little babies and suddenly, boom, I had a kundalini awakening. And I would say that was the pivotal transformation moment. If, if you want one particular moment, it, it lasted for a couple of weeks and... If people don't know what kundalini means, it's it's the awakening of energies um, that are, it feels like it's inside the body, but it's sort of the basis of who we are, which drives the physical reality that we sense and feel and see. So that was the, the real beginning of a whole bunch of um, spiritual journeys on my part. Was oh. there some, was there something specifically that triggered the kundalini, or do, do you recall? I, yeah, I believe there was. That, that, the Kundalini awakening happened in the fall of, I believe that was 1994. And earlier in the year, some like eight or nine months earlier, I felt like I had overslept. I felt like I was kind of in a trance, like sleepwalking, and I needed to wake up. And I felt that need so much that I commented on it. And the, the, I said exactly that to my cousin who was visiting from Germany. And I told her, I just feel like I've overslept. And she's very spiritual. And she nodded and she said, well, you know, that she, she didn't quite exactly know what I meant, but she knew that something big was going to be coming my way. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. You know, within the year, then um, this rush of energy just came through me and I felt like I was like electrocuted or on fire or something. There's just so much energy flowing. If, if it hasn't happened to you, then it's hard to explain. And each experience, I'm sure, is quite different. But for me, I was waking up each night, um, looking at a digital clock at exactly at 111, and I try to go back to sleep, wake up exactly at 222. I think this is getting real. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we both know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. It, it, 444, 555. And I'm like, okay. And it would happen night after night. And that was the normal part of events. Yeah, you know, that's the part where, like, at least I know I'm looking at a clock. 
the rest of the time I'm dealing with spirits and instantaneous astral travel and seeing everything around me in 360 degrees. Um, just extraordinary experiences. And I wasn't doing any drugs. <laughs> I need to say that too. Not drinking any alcohol. No, I, I didn't do any hallucinogenic drugs. Nothing like that. So this just all came of its own. Um, just to see the nature of reality, which is something that I actually wished for for a long time. And now I know that when you wish for something like that, your wish will be granted. Yeah. You know? Yeah, be careful what you ask for. Oh boy. Yeah. You know, you know, Cynthia, I did a lots of drugs in college and I never had any of the experiences that I did during meditation. So, you know, they always say, well, maybe he was on drugs. I was like, sorry, I never tried any drugs that good. <laughs> exactly. There's, there's nothing that good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because uh, some of the things that happened during that Kundalini experience were amazing. You know, I, I felt so much love. It, I guess it's like when some people talk about near-death experiences. And, and at one time when I was traveling, I could hear the sound that this universe makes. Um, and it really sounded like ohm, you know, that very deep mm -hmm. ohm. I can't even go that low. It was so <laughs> smooth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when people chant that and they do that, They've heard it, or is someone that, you know, is doing that definitely did. And I had no idea that that was such a real sound. So that was just so one of so many things that happened. But uh, that was definitely the breakthrough point. And then after the breakthrough, then I protested, you know, tried to hold on to what was left of what I thought my sanity was slipping away. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, exactly. Yeah. I, <laughs> I I actually ended up in three days observation at one point. <laughs> oh, I can see that that could happen so easily. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fortunately, I was telling friends, like, I'm hearing voices. I'm seeing things. But uh, I had a very supportive group of friends at the time, fortunately. Yeah, because I, yeah. I can see now in retrospect, you could get locked up for a lot of that. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I um, was reading an article with the new, uh, I forgot what the book is called, but the new psychology uh, psychology book that they use, the psychiatrists use to, you know, to diagnose certain things. Uh, you can get, you can get pretty much uh, locked up or, or called uh, depressed uh, if someone dies. Wow. Like, they recommend drugs, you know, if, if you're grieving and it's like, what? That's important. Yeah. People yeah. If you look at the new book, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I think people need hugs. They need touch. They need someone to listen. And it seems like when we are so eager to prescribe pharmaceuticals, we're missing the point of a lot of things. Yeah. 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 We yeah. definitely are. Yeah. You know, there's there's some absolutely amazing people out there that you know are able to coach people through those experiences quite well and and uh, gracefully. Actually, it's funny you mention that because this is there's something weird that has happened to me. I, I've got an unlisted phone number, and out of the blue, um, I think about five times, I've received phone calls from people who are in the middle of a kind of a bad Kundalini experience, and I don't know how they get my phone number, but they call me right from the middle of it, and I I have walked about five people through it, which is very bizarre. And I'm just mentioning that now because um, what I'm trying to say is. The universe is much stranger than we know, and just the fact that they get the phone number that way. Can you imagine? You're in the midst of a bad Kundalini experience, and some spirit says, call this phone number right now. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Even weirder, the person on the other end of the phone understands what's going on. You know? <laughs> it, uh, this universe, is, I mean, I, I, I say this constantly. I mean, I'm in constant awe. I mean, it just how, I mean, I don't, no one can, I can't figure out how all this works, but it does. And it comes, I mean, it comes, some of these things come to you in such bizarre ways. You know, I used to think that one plus one equaled two, but now I think one plus one equals seven million eight hundred and thirty nine. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, definitely, uh, um, yeah, it's interesting to say the least, to say the very least. And I think your show is doing a great service to people just to remind them of the, you know, that when we raise our vibration up to that higher level, 
that it's you're greeted by so many other people who are doing the same thing and we're raising the vibrations of the entire planet that way it's just a big effect i mean i love the hundredth monkey uh, name for the show because it, oh, it just yeah. conveys yeah. that concept yeah yeah it's it's it, we and i well with this name we've definitely looked into the the whole conscious field quite a bit and uh you know i i'm very conscious of it and part of that is due to doing this radio show. Uh, I'm very conscious of that energy, and it's been a tremendous boon for me personally, uh, developing my own my own abilities and my ability to sense energy, to feel energies, uh, and to work with energies. And uh, ju just this, oh, gee, since. Uh, First, I, I'm going to have to ask you how you experienced 2012, the December 21st thing, but I'll, ha I'll share with you how I experienced it first. Uh, I went through about a, the, a week before. It seemed like a, a, a switch flipped about a week before the 21st and a, an exponential increase in that chaotic and fear-based and uh, just the... the that there was everything mixed into this energy and it was just building and building and building the tension was rising and i went to bed on the night of the 20th with this with this just huge ball of energy that was just uh felt like something was ready to burst and i woke up the next morning and it was the calmest i have ever sensed the energy in my life i mean even before i woke up i mean i i always had some sense of the energy around me uh, but, uh, when I got up that morning, it was like, uh, it was like, uh, in the void, you know, there's absolutely, I sensed absolutely no energy out there. It was, well, that's not really accurate, but it was just calm. It was completely calm. And, uh, well, since then things have been, uh, quite interesting, but I'm curious to, curious to know how you experienced the, the, uh, December 21st event. Yeah, for me it was, um, well, I'd remote viewed it many years earlier just to get a sense of, you know, what's happening then. And so having done that, it was pretty much what, it's like what you said, very still, very calm. And there was a peaceful quality that was um, extraordinary. And I chose uh, not to go to any events or anything that day. I, I wanted to experience just the, the threshold crossing um, in a very meditative way, which is hard to do if there are lots of people and chaos and noise, right. and so it was um, it was really nice. It just felt like going from one entire epic to another. It, I realized, like you said, that this is a much um, it's like a slower moving threshold. Then it's not just that one day. It's not that one hour. It really did start, you know, maybe even weeks, months before. Just like when you're watching sort of a, a solar event, like an eclipse. Right. And, you can go get a cup of coffee, come back. Right. Again, you know, get another cup of coffee. <laughs> so, uh, 2012 was like that too. It's, it was slow. It, it was, um, I feel like we're still kind of going through it, even though it's 2013. We're, oh, man. You know. Yeah. So, they, something new every day. Yeah. yeah. So still, now we're on the other side of it and I, I could feel it was coming like months before and there, there was a lot of chaos and what you described was very accurate about the global emotions and energies surrounding that event. There had been a lot of fear. And I think there was just a great deal of relief when people got to the other side, realized, oh, we're still here. So. <laughs> yeah. Now what am I going to do? I can't fixate on tw December 21st anymore. I'm going to have to live my life. Oh, my. Right. <laughs> and yeah. There was a huge group of people that were waiting for the ships, you know, or waiting to ascend or, or they, they wanted to leave. You know, they wanted to leave. We're going to go. We're going to ascend into the fifth dimension and won't have to deal with third dimensional life anymore. Yeah, yeah but that's kind of like eating the meal and not wanting to do the dishes. So, right. you know, I think we need to just chop wood, carry water, and carry on. So. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, going going back um, to the time when you worked in Citibank, because I had heard you say that even uh, back then, you were still like sensitive and, and using your intuition. Absolutely. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, the corporate world is an amazing place for intuitives because, and I think a lot of intuitives are in the corporate world and medicine and lots of, you know, 
regular, typical types of career paths. And for me, what it was like was, um, well, as usual, as I've been doing for decades, I didn't really speak much of it. I would just act on the intuitive information I'd get, which meant that if if I could tell that one person was actually doing what they should be doing, then I could I just relied on that they would be carrying their end of things. Other people I could tell for sure they weren't, and so I would be checking in more often and asking, you know, how to work around that area, or maybe just not count on what they're doing at all and work on more effective uses of my time in areas that were definitely moving forward. It made it a lot easier to you know, interact with other people. In other words, I could see the energy of things as well as the energy around people. So it's not just like telling, um, you know, who's telling the truth. It's much more a matter of um, where the strong, high energy is and what's what's actually happening. And people can sense this. You know, you can sense when there's someone with tremendous charisma entering the room. You know, people will all stop talking. Their heads will turn. You know, there's almost a hush across the room. Right. And it's really people's reaction, like, wow, a presence is here. You know, someone is here. And yeah. it's it's a big deal. So I think um, in the business world, a lot of people get caught up in just doing what they see on paper or what people tell them to do. And I would much, in, instead of doing that, I'd go where the energy was. And, and thanks to that intuitive approach it i gave it looked to an outside observer like i was like doing the work of you know three to seven people uh, you know on a good day like seven people on not such a good day like the work of three people just simply because i was really efficient very little time was wasted because i could just tell like well no point doing this one today but everything's happening over here so i'd make a phone call um, to new york or wherever it was that the project needed me I was working at at Citibank at the time, so you know we had um, matrix management. So there'd be projects across the entire continent, you know, from the west coast to the east coast, Nevada, Utah, and you know, it was right at the time that the bank was going between all the states. So, mm. and inter um, the in, not the internet, but the um, IT department. They called it data processing back then, but now it's information technology. Yeah. So when did you realize that, that you were able to use your intuition? Is it something you always use from a kid or something later on in life? Yeah, as a child, I used it a lot because um, I could tell um, my, my dad did, had sort of a temper. And so when I was very young, like five or six or seven, like all kids do, I'd have toys all over the place. <clears throat> but at a certain time of day, I learned to check on him remotely, you know, just to see what kind of mood is dad in. And if he's not in the kind of mood to want to be walking through a whole bunch of tinker toys, then um, I, I just instantly know time to clean everything up, you know, get everything all out of the way so it's not all over the front entryway and the, the hallway and, you know. <laughs> so, you know, because he had a bit of a temper, so it's was very, um, it was a response. And I think this happens to a lot of kids that grow up in a family where one of the family members um, might have an anger problem or um, in some cases people have drinking problems. So the intuitive kids in those families developed their abilities. And I'm pretty sure that that was, you know, I, I can give a lot of credit to my dad for that because I, I don't think I would have been that tuned in to know, oh, it's a good day, everything's fine, you know, or uh-oh. Clean up everything now. Go to your room. <laughs> totally quiet, you know. <laughs> and it was pretty easy for me to do. And I I guess I didn't realize other people weren't necessarily doing it. I could also tell what he was thinking. And all, not just him, other people. Well, you know what it's like. So I, I learned to open myself up so that I could be much more connected and tuned in. But I also learned not to talk about it because um, a lot of the things that I could feel and sense and see... Uh, I became aware nobody else was seeing those things. <laughs> so it's sort of like you. You, know, you also you also get a sense on how receptive pe to people are to subjects. You know, if you think about a subject and you you know read a person energetically, you can see whether or not they're ready for it. Right. Or, or so, they'll could, give you the poo poo. Yeah, like like my grand. That's a great way to say it. My grandmother loved talking about angels, and she was a Lutheran Christian, so you know she loved talking about. Anything of a spiritual nature, but that was 
definitely not okay really in my with my parents so what what kind of religious background do you have or or was there a religion in the family um not so much with my parents my dad was a self-proclaimed atheist when i was growing up and my mom was an agnostic although she'd been raised by her mother and father that were the lutherans that i was talking about and so my grandmother was close to me and thanks to her you know she would ask me to um, pay attention to my dreams and she would ask me it's kind of an unusual lutheran because she she would often ask me to uh, read the tea leaves in my cup and showed me how to read cards and interpret signals and symbols from the universe and things that were going on so that this is not normal at all for most lutherans i, I didn't know that at the time <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, that's not really part of the Lutheran faith. <laughs> <laughs> These are <for> bonus goodies. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that, ki- that kind of reminds me of my father's side of the family where um, they're um, extremely re- religious. Like uh, my father and my grandmother were very, very religious, but they were the ones who were constantly like, they've seen uh, greys and seen ships and my grandmother even... Do a, uh, I think it was a scissor at a shapeshifter. Wow. You know, like, yeah, like, <laughs> you, don't, you don't really expect that from them. So, yeah, I, I know. know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so, Ramon, go ahead and dive into your potatoes. What was that you were getting ready to ask before I was so rude to you? Uh, well, it's just, I mean, there's so many different channels that we can go, but I'll, I'll pick one and then we'll you know, we'll sweep through the whole segment, which, cause they all tie into each other. And that, you know, I'll tell you my um, story real quick and then we can start from there. And that is, um, I have went to, um, to East Eddy and uh, it's a place where, you know, there's a lot of UFOs. I don't know if you ever heard of it, James Gilliland. And anyway, the, I went there and I saw this lady uh, give this talk and her name is uh, Miriam Delgado. She gave this talk and then, you know, she came up to a, to me and two other gentlemen that we were like talking in Spanish and she started talking Spanish to us and we had a small conversation and that was it. I didn't see her the next day or anything. And then uh, the next year I was like, oh. Why don't you, why didn't you guys have Miriam Belcaro this year? Because she was really good and, you know, she's a really friendly person. It was like, yeah, we didn't have Miriam last year. And I was, yes, you did. And no, we didn't. Uh, here's the, you know, the catalog who we had. And I was like, oh crap, really? And then, um, you know, once we started the show, I told, um, I told Miriam about this and, I called her up and interviewed her and she was like, no, I never went there, but the people do say that this does happen, that they met me and I I don't remember ever being in that place. So I, I started off with that because I remember hearing before of, you know, these time shifts or, or yeah, exactly. you know, where you put something down and it's gone and it appears in a weird place or... Yeah, I've got a book called Reality Shifts, and I describe in it just something really similar to what you're talking about, um, except mine was more frustrating. Well, they're always frustrating, I guess. <laughs> but in my <laughs> case... Feel nuts is what they do. <laughs> yeah, I was attending a conference in England, um, and this was for some software that my husband at the time had developed, and one of the architects that was using it was from the biggest architecture firm in all of the United Kingdom, Ove Arup, you know, a very big firm. And I was so excited to see his name on the program. And um, it was printed right on the program, on my program, on everyone's program. I even commented on it to my husband. Then we got up for a break. We came back, sat down at our seats. And I was checking the program, like, okay, when is this wonderful presentation going to happen? And I guess you know where I'm going with this. Uh, he was no longer on the program. <laughs> and I, I was like, what? This can't be. You know, I, I don't understand it. His his name was here, now it's gone. I didn't even get to meet him. Was he in the room? And I'm looking around like kind of desperately. Like, how could this have happened? Did someone reprint everything? Did they change it? So I was running around during the break. People hadn't come back. And every single program had been changed. 
And at this point, I'm still thinking, you know, the organizers made a last-minute change, they printed everything, but then I'm thinking, but then why did they fold this person's program and tuck it just like that under a cup? And why is that one, you know, like, nah, they didn't change all these. And that was the really strange experience. At least you got to meet Miriam. That's where I'm going with this. Huh. Yeah. That's so cool. Did you get, he, did you get anybody else who cooperated seeing his name on the program? Uh, just my husband at the time, the two of us, because I'd mentioned it to him. I said, huh. look, you know, we've got someone coming from over up. This is amazing. You know, they're using it at that company. This is great. Um, but no, he, um, just totally vanished. But I've, I've, in the same vein as this, I've also gotten emails from people who want to tell me about the time they, they saw me give a talk at UC Berkeley back when I was a student there. Um, now, I was very shy, in, at least as far as I can recall. I don't remember that I gave these talks. However, um, now that I know, what I, what I always say to these people is, you know, I probably did, but I don't remember it, and it must have been some other reality. Because it, it just happens too often, and it's more than one person remembering that I gave this inspirational talk at UC Berkeley. Mm. But I was, yeah. I was just... I was a very um, nerdy, um, withdrawn, introverted physics student. Yeah. I wasn't giving talks, at least not in this, not what I remember. Yeah, it, it's it, it always blows my mind because I remember I was hearing of um, certain famous people dying, and then um, you know they're not dead, or, or even um, I had a close. This one really freaked me out. It was like, oh yeah, you know, so and so died. He. He fell out of a five-story window, and and you know, and I was like, "Oh man, that's terrible!" And then two years later, I run into him on the street, which freaked me out. Right. And I was like, "Oh my!" And, and you know, and of course, I'm not gonna say, "Wait, you're dead." <laughs> <laughs> but I was after he left. I told the people that were around me, like, he was dead, and they were like, "Okay." Stop smoking that stuff. <laughs> now, was that a friend of yours? Like someone that you... I wouldn't say he was like a friend friend. It was somebody... Um, When I was in my late teens and early 20s, I used to go to the clubs a lot. And I knew him from the clubs. And um, so... But I was told that he had died, that he fell out of a five-story window. Right. Well, and, this happens a lot. Um, And I, I don't know if you've seen... I've got newsletter um, articles that were all about this, special issues of reality shifters, talking about the alive again phenomenon. And what you're describing is the most typical case. It's it's usually not your your spouse. It's usually not your boyfriend or girlfriend or daughter or parents. It's usually someone sort of on the periphery, like a friend that you haven't seen for a while, or a celebrity that it's not your favorite celebrity, but someone that you're aware of. And, and that's what's so amazing, because a lot of people... If you ask them, do you remember that Nelson Mandela died? Oh, I was just going to say Mandela because I know, I know I heard he died a couple of years ago. Right. <laughs> and, and a lot of people remember that he died while he was in prison, which is even, that, that's what I remember, and that was quite a while ago. And so it's very interesting when you look at, like, how many people remember that he died already and at what points in time. And the fact that these alternate histories exist is pretty much confirmation for what physicists are currently saying that we live in a superposition of states. That means, um, you know, everything exists in a superposition of states. This is a big deal that this is now becoming the majority opinion of physicists going to conferences. Here's the reason it's a big deal. It used to be commonly understood that, of course, a quantum particle would exist in a superposition of states. You know, it's it's kind of like kind of here, kind of there, kind of everywhere, kind of in a fog. It's, you know, there's a distribution, a probability distribution of where that thing is. And so um, be, because of that, that, that's why we've got so many different interpretations of quantum physics. The physics itself is math, uh, but then how you interpret it explains um, what's going on here. Like, are we living in a hologram, kind of like the holodeck on Star Trek? Or are we living in parallel universes? You know? And so these are the kind of things that have popped up as possible explanations. Um, but the fact that you and me and everything is also in that superposition of states means that we're going to have alternate histories. We're going to be coming, um, you know, whether you want to think of it as parallel universes, which I think is pretty good theory right now. Yeah, I'm kind of there myself. 
especially based on what happened with the Higgs boson recently. Um, you know, the fact that they just have that one super, super heavy particle, and you, we, we haven't found lots of other particles um, around it, at nothing at all. So there's a big question then as to um, what kind of an outlier this universe really is. It's pretty improbable is what's going on. You know, just the fact that there's that much dark matter and this big, heavy Higgs boson particle. It's very, un, it's, it's kind of like we're in a very highly improbable universe. Which, what, what happens when you realize that is that you realize, wow, there must be a multiverse. You know, there must be just all kinds of other possible universes out there. So. Yeah, yeah, that, that definitely is the only thing that I can even come close to wrapping my mind around now to even try to make sense of what's happening in my life personally. I mean, just, just the, the, all the anomalies and the, Miracles. It's only you know, in in old language, the miracles that are constantly happening. I like that word. I, I'm a big <laughs> fan of it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> yeah, you know what I find amazing is um, around the 1990s, and I don't know if it's just because I um, people started becoming aware of it or talking about it, but the old paintings with with the UFOs and um and things like that and you know I kind of almost feel like earlier in time in the 80s no one spoke about that or even I don't remember seeing any pictures and and at least seeing that part and being like oh what's that but not even that and then all of a sudden in the 90s all these pictures started coming up so I always, always wonder if it, any time travelers just went back and then changed everything Another one of those parallel universes folded into ours. So have you guys had lots of UFO sightings? And have you noticed any greys or other aliens in uh, you know, dreams, daydreams, or reality? Uh, I've seen tons and tons and tons of lights in the sky. That's the best way yeah. I can put it. Right. And energetically, I, I know that there is consciousness behind every one of them. Uh, but as far as having a, a, uh, you know, a, uh, real tangible, uh, well, I, I had one sighting that was unmistakable, uh, a craft in the sky that couldn't have been more than a mile away from me uh, that was unmistakable UFO, uh, you know, un unidentified flying object that was not of terrestrial origin, uh, the, the, Absolutely no doubt in my mind on that one. But most of them, I, 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 you know, there's always that shadow of doubt left there. Uh, you know, okay, it could be, you know, uh, somebody up there in something we made or, you know, there's all sorts of different, uh, uh, excuses for them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I, I know there's something there. I, I have no doubt. I think it's interesting what you mentioned about the 80s, because that's when um, I had a series of dreams, like every, this is way before the Kundalini experience, back when this whole subject wouldn't have, um, well, it was kind of strange. I, I just, every night I'd fall asleep and dream that I was working with aliens on something called the Global Mind Redesign Project. And I was basically part of quality assurance. I oh, that sounds it. crazy. No, but it was, it was so real. And I'd wake up exhausted every morning, like I really had been working all night, just, you know, test driving these different kinds of, um, you know, sort of like minds that the new wave of humans could use. And, and this is back when I was kind of laughing at the harmonic convergence and everything, like, oh, that's funny. You know, I was kind of on what you... <laughs> <laughs> but then here I am, involved in this, like, this high-level top secret pro project, and I was convinced that there were, like, UFOs hovering around outside my house. And I would try to show my husband, like, look, I know it's there. He said, I don't see anything. I said, yeah, but they, they, they're they really small. And and I, I wasn't even watching Doctor Who or anything like that, but later I did. And it's like, that's it. It's, it's kind of like they're small on the outside, but they're big on the inside. These are interdimensional travelers. So, anyway, um, yeah. just a little story from the 1980s. But it went on for a while. It was like a... I don't know, like a 10 day project or something. It was a big deal. And we, they were, what they were working on, and it was decided through consensus, like, okay, the next wave of humans will be very psychic, you know, to put it, it, they didn't call it that, but kind of like the best of the hive mentality, where everybody shares a little bit of consciousness. 
but at the same time retaining individual creativity. So it was an amazing period of time. That many dreams, all so similar. So it left me feeling like something, there's something to this. You know, something just happened here. <laughs> and then I realized um, that, there, like you said, there wasn't too much about aliens back then. You know, just Whitney, Whitley Stryber, but it was all stuff like, I've been abducted and very scary. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, I get flashes. Yeah. I get flashes occasionally of, uh, of memory from, you know, the night before where I was in amongst a bunch of other people somewhere. And that's about all I, I've gotten out of those types of flashes. But, um, yeah, I know I, I, I've been able, I, I've actually been a, have you been able to do the out of body travel, the conscious stuff? Yes, yes. Um, it's what an experience. Because, yeah. And, and I think that, that it, it weaves into this whole subject of reality shifting too, because uh, when you realize that you're able to travel not just here on what you might think of as this one world, but you can actually, um, go through this imaginal realm. You can go through what near-death experiencers talk about, that you can access all realities. You can kind of see what all these different possibilities are for you. Yeah. And yeah. there's no need to be afraid of anything. You can just um, you know, be courageous in your life and be who you really are meant to be You know, at your full potential. Once again, what I love about your show here... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, uh, was able, I had a spontaneous out of body, you know, back in 1989 or 1990. And, uh, then I spent the next 20 years trying to recreate it until I finally did, uh, oh, I guess it's been four years ago now, three years ago now, four years ago. Anyways, uh, but yeah, uh, what an experience. Talk about take all fear of death away completely. I mean, my first conscious intentional experience. Uh, I came back and fear was gone. Worry was gone. Worry about everything in this world was gone. Right. And, and it's just an amazing experience when you, when you can go into that place, co go in and come back out, uh, without losing your thread of consciousness and know the reality of it. Uh, wow. Wow. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is something that, um, uh, most people might think that they can't do it or it sounds complicated, but, but what I think if everybody knows that they dream, they daydream, and that's really the beginning of it. That's sort of how it opens up. And the trick, like you said, is to retain that sense of identity of, of who you really are. That, and that requires getting to know who you are, of course. Exactly. Exactly. But this is the stuff I love. It's just, um, that book I was mentioning, Reality Shifts, it's all about how our consciousness is really um, jumping between these realities. That's the traveler. So when you identify with your consciousness, um, then you can realize that so many different possibilities are open to you. And and when you get into that state of love, amazing things can happen. That's when all the synchronicities happen, and yeah. you can just experience um, just phenomenal things. What I find amazing is that in dreams, there's, um, you know, these certain areas when you have a certain type of dream and you know this area and you know these people. And when you come out of the dream, like, you're like, what? But in the dream, you know everything. It's almost like a separate life. It almost feels like. And it, 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 it's just, um, mind blowing that that the, this happens but i remember having one dream where this gray came up to me and i felt like i knew him and i just went over and grabbed his hand and when i grabbed his hand we just vanished <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, i don't know did, what to you, say about him. did did you appear somewhere else with him no i don't remember i just remember seeing myself disappear hmm. it's almost like I went, I saw him, I walked down the stairs, I grabbed his hand, and then it's like my consciousness pulled back and saw me vanish with him, and then that's it. I can't tell you anything else about that. Hmm. So, so, uh, you know, you, you had these dreams about, uh, this new, uh, glo uh global consciousness initiative that was, uh, in, in the works. Uh, have you, uh, queried the, uh, conscious field or higher self or guides or however you term those for yourself 
uh, about what's going on right now and, and if that is a reality, if there is a program out there that is designed to help shift the consciousness on the planet? I believe it is real. Uh, th- this was back in the 1980s and so, um, shortly after that I started, uh, well then I started paying a lot more attention, like what's going on with, is there anything about the new kids? And I, I heard a lot about indigo kids and crystal kids, so, um, I, I believe that those dreams I was having were very much connected to what we're experiencing, that we do have children that are coming in now that are eligible. You know, so the next generations that are that were born in the 90s and on, um, it seems like a lot of them just come in with a knowingness. And, and frankly, I had a lot of that knowingness when I was a kid too. So I think, um, I think a lot of us, like you guys, um, you don't need to be born in the 90s or sooner to be that tuned in there were a lot of front runners you know people that wanted to be here for this amazing time of awakening which i believe this really is that um there's a a greater awareness and an attunement of the the oneness of of all that is than i've ever seen before at least certainly when i was a kid I, i wasn't noticing that level of awareness and we have a long way to go but i noticed that there's a great deal of um respect for a diversity of spiritual paths and there's an, a broadening awareness of intrinsic um sort of like a sovereignty of spirit would be what i'd call it just that that there is that oneness that spark that we all have that inner divinity and it, it just feels like there's more of a recognition at this point in time than i've ever seen you know what's what's funny is with those kids born in in the 90s um, because most of them are turning adults or adults already, is that they're so much easier to talk to when it comes to this whole woo-woo stuff. Um, they're, I feel like they're a lot open to it when you start talking about UFOs and, and this mass consciousness. They're open and it's easier to talk to them about that than it is to talk to them about like um, the business world or something like that, you know, something more 3D. Uh, I, I, that to be my experience. That's that seems true. And I, I've got two daughters that are now in their twenties, and they're telling me that um, people their age are very interested in the work I do, which was never the case before. But now I guess they're all in college, and and my daughters are both kind of surprised to tell me that. Like, well, you won't believe this, mom, but I was talking to someone, and they were really interested in ex- very much your areas of interest. I told them my mom writes books about that. And they said, really? <laughs> yeah, she's got a website. Really? Hmm. So I think you're right, yeah. And yeah. I, so I can't, I can't really tell when I go to events because the people that come there are interested in the subject already. But it's interesting when I hear people that are not expected to be interested in it are very interested. You know, what's something that I've noticed, and, and I've spoke about several times on the show, uh, I build ambulances for a living. So, uh, I work in a, uh, in a plant that has, oh, we have almost a hundred people in production. And, uh, everybody there knows. I, I mean, we've been doing this show for two and a half years now. And, and even prior to that, you know, I was, uh, you know, not your normal Joe. So, uh, you know, I, I talked about consciousness and spirituality and, and chasing them UFOs. Yeah, chasing UFOs. And, and I used to get, it was, it was normally the response I got from almost everybody there was, uh, don't stand too close to Tom because you don't want to get hit by the lightning when he gets struck down type thing. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but, but, and this is something a new a new development since the since in the, in 2013 where I have had almost weekly I have somebody different come up and meet to me and talk to me about things outside the box, asking me questions about. Uh, well, I had a guy ask me uh, just uh, last, uh, I guess it was Thursday, uh, came up and asked me, "What the hell's really going on here, Tom? Is this is this all just?" What's, what's with this whole spirituality thing? Uh, it, it, he's having some things happen in his life that he just doesn't quite understand. You know, some synchronicities that are happening and, and it's making him, making people ask questions. 
And and it this is this is coming from people that I would have swore two years ago I would have swore these guys are never gonna come out of the box, you know. Right. But, oh, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, I'm actually uh, very, very optimistic about uh, where we're going now. So I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> excited time to be here. I mean, this is freaking awesome. <laughs> but, that's right. So we're we're just about to the uh, top of the first hour here, and uh, God, what do you got? You got six books out there now. Is that what it is? Yeah, well, the ones that um, people are most familiar with would be Reality Shifts. That's the one I'm talking about a lot. And then there's another one that's related to that. It's Reality Shifters Guide to High Energy Money. So it's all about prosperity. And then there, I've got one about Aura Advantage, uh, which is all about the energy field and the aura. And then I've got a children's book, Karen Kimball and the Dreamweaver's Web. So those are the, the big ones, the, the top four. I've also got a meditation CD, and then I've got an ebook called Shine with the Aura of Success. So it's a bunch of different things. They're all on my website and pretty much all over at Amazon.com as well. Awesome. And that is uh, CynthiaSueLarson.com. Am I? RealityShifters.com. Excuse me. Right. RealityShifters.com. All right, guys. Well, uh, I want to thank you guys for listening to the first hour here. And if you're not a member yet, I would urge you to hit that join button and uh, join the 100th Monkey Radio and be that 100th Monkey. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh, you can find that at www.100thmonkeyradio.com. And uh, we will continue this conversation in the second hour. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. The love you deny is a pain you carry. And by the way, we will dive into auras and how to see them and what they mean and stuff like that for the second hour. Just to give you a little glimpse there. And so is to be the change that you wish to see in the world. Freedom's calling, I feel the fire that's deep inside us Everybody wants change, but tell me who will guide us To the leaders that pass away, put up your lighters It's a beautiful struggle, but it cannot divide us We're the ones that we've always been waiting for See yourself in the mirror, but open up the door Walk through it and feel the love throughout your pores Be the light, life's purpose is to feel joy Metaphysical, lyrical, saying enough for truth The only one to make change is walking in your shoes Be the example, don't complain about the news Making music and serving the world with the loo Now you can be the same, or you can be the Change, find strength from inside, break through the chains. No one to blame, nothing to prove. You create your reality, it's up to you. Be the change that you wanna see in the world. I got me live for peace. Aspire to be someone who fights for the beliefs. Like more and lose the king. Aspire to be that love, that light, like Christ, this light for the moment in need. And if you believe in Jehovah, Allah, Buddha, Christians love to me. So yearns for peace in a world that's flooded with war History's littered with body scar Trying to settle the score To maintain an archaic platform of power and greed People fight for land out of survival and need So I'm killing my television and I'm planting a seed To fill my head with knowledge that I'm seeing received Due to the media propaganda killing my creed Or what don't kill me make me stronger Feeling straight when I bleed Fight for interest and forwards attach the feet They try to sell you anything in this world Nothing for free Land air, fire and water They keep up in the ante While the anti-proletariat's hold the powers to be But we keep fighting, survive and thrive and recycling and rhyme and we constantly incline and we see through the lying and blind they tactically keep trying to keep you from asking the why change that you want to see in the world like Gandhi live for peace aspire to be someone who fights for the beliefs like more and lose the king aspire to be of that love that light like Christ this light for the moment in need and if you believe in Jehovah Allah Buddha Christians Allah. love to me we find solutions Possibilities creating organizations like Aspire to be inspiring young minds to see Building life skills, nurturing creativity Fulfilling the youth's basic needs Listening actively, teaching the tools to succeed Positive role models, we plant the seed The root strength of all of which 